Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Today, what I want to talk to you about is a relationship between complex analysis and algebraic geometry. After all, one of the roots of modern algebraic geometry comes actually from analysis, and in particular, complex analysis. And today, in particular, I want to talk to you about the relationship between doubly periodic functions, which arise in the theory of complex variables, and cubic curves in algebraic geometry. Okay, so let's start by reminding ourselves what a doubly periodic function is. Okay, so we're going to look at functions f from c to c. And doubly periodic means that instead of having one period, there are two. So we're going to assume two periods, one and tau. And usually you'll see later we're going to assume that the imaginary part of tau is actually positive. And remember, if you had a periodic function with period 1, that means that when you evaluate the function f at z plus 1, it's the same as the value of the function f at z. So we certainly want this condition here, and we want to also to be periodic with respect to tau, which means that f of z plus tau is equal to f of z as well. So a doubly periodic function with periods 1 and tau is simply one that satisfies this equation for all values of z complex in the domain. Now, to understand this function, it's often useful to consider the following subgroup of the additive group C. It's going to be z plus z tau. So just the abelian subgroup generated by 1 and tau. Let's draw this on the Argan diagram. It's easy enough, so of course you have zero. And you also have the integers, one, two, and so forth. You also have all scalar multiples of tau, tau, two tau, three tau, minus tau, and so forth. And also sums of them as well. And the first point to note is that if you look at this subgroup lambda of C, you can take the quotient C mod lambda. And of course, that's a quotient group. But also, because C has a topology, you've also got an induced topological space. And that's going to be C mod lambda is the two torus. OK, so why are we interested in that? Well, remember, often, if you look at periodic functions on the real line, one way to think of them is that you have a function defined from 0 to 1. And then if it's period 1, it repeats itself on 1 to 2, and so forth. And so you can think of it as a function on the quotient of R with Z. So that's the, they're just functions on a circle. Here now you have two periods. So the values that you see in this parallelogram with vertices 0, tau, 1, and 1 plus tau, you can think of these doubly periodic functions as having values uh, somehow on this parallelogram, and they repeat themselves as you move over by shifting by adding 1, or when you shift by adding tau. So you can think of these doubly periodic functions as actually functions on this quotient, on this two torus. OK, so let's try to come up with some examples of these doubly periodic functions. And the most famous one is due to Weierstrass, a German mathematician from the 19th century, who worked a lot in analysis. And this goes by the name of the P function. Um, and it's defined as follows. Okay, P of Z is given by this expansion here, this infinite sum. And uh, the most important thing is that it's doubly periodic. And the periods are given by 1 and tau in this notation here. Okay, so it's just 1 on Z squared plus the sum over all non-zero elements in this lattice lambda of this expression here, 1 on z minus lambda squared minus 1 on lambda squared. Now, this term here is just a constant, so it doesn't affect the periodicity at all. But otherwise, you're essentially making a sum over the same type of term 
but over all elements of lambda. So what happens when you replace z with z plus 1 or z plus tau? Basically, you just change the order of summation. You either shift all these summation variables by 1 or by tau. But otherwise, the sum is the same, and that's why this function here is doubly periodic. So that's the first interesting thing about this function. But there are other interesting things about this function as well. So in some ways, this is the easiest such function to consider because the poles involved are very simple. So as you can see, there are double poles at 0 and also at all these lambdas. And here, lambdas are the non-zero elements in this lattice, capital lambda. But other than those double poles, it's an analytic function everywhere else. The other thing that's nice about this is if you look at all the terms here, they only involve squares or powers of the squares of the z or, or the z minus lambda. So it turns out that this is an even function. Okay, so be, to be more precise, if you replace z with minus z, of course this stays the same, but what happens to this one here? If you replace z with minus z, the term corresponding to lambda gets flipped over to the term corresponding to minus lambda. So this is also an even function. So how is this Weierstrass p function related to algebraic geometry, where the objects of study are polynomial equations and their solution? Well, the answer to that question lies in this rather interesting lemma here. It states the following. You can find constants g2 and g3, so they're going to be complex numbers, which give you the following polynomial relationship between the Weierstrass p function, p of z, and also its derivative. So more precisely, it states that the square of the derivative is equal to 4 times the cube of p of z plus this constant g2 times p of z plus this constant g3. So this is a rather wonderful fact, and the proof is rather interesting, and it uses a little bit of complex analysis. Okay, so let me tell you, tell you why it's true. So the easiest way to see why it's true is to consider the Taylor series at zero of the functions involved, p of z and p prime of z. Okay, so let's look at p of z first. So here we noted that the only poles it has are double poles, and they're at lambda. In particular, there's one at zero. So there's the term that contributes to the pole at zero. So hence, the first term that you see in this uh, Taylor expansion is one on z squared. The second thing to note is that p of z, this is an even function. And so the only terms that can occur here are even powers of z. So the next term that you can have up here is the constant term. I claim that the constant term is zero. And why is that? Well, to get at that constant term, we remove the one on z squared, and we see what's the value at zero here. Well, when you put in z equals zero, this term is identical to this term. The difference cancels, so you're summing zeros, and the total is zero. And so, indeed, the constant term here is zero, and the next term you have is some multiple of z squared. Great, that gives you the Taylor series of p of z at zero. To get the Taylor series of its derivative, we just differentiate term by term. One on z squared differentiated gives you minus two on z cubed. The derivative of c z squared gives you two c z, and the higher order terms start from z cubed. So now we want to use this to establish this polynomial relationship. So we'll look at this term minus this term. p prime of z squared minus 4p of z cubed. So let's have a look at the highest negative power of z. So if you square this one, I guess you get the square of this. Squaring the 2 gives you 4, and it's of order 
1 on z cubed squared, which is z to the minus 6. What happens here? When you cube this, you also get z to the minus 6. So if you subtract 4 of them, you cancel off that z to the minus 6 term. So that term has gone, and you look at the next term up. So what order is that? We won't do such a close analysis. Let's look at the next term up. When you cube this, I guess you have the square of this times this. So that's z to the minus 4 times z squared is z to the minus 2. So all in all, when you do the analysis with the Taylor series, you can see that the next term up is some constant times z to the minus 2, and you can call that constant g2. And further analyzing, you can see that the next term up is going to be constant. You can also see this by the fact that this is an odd function squared, so it's even, and this is an even function, so this has to be the Taylor series of an even function. Okay, so we're getting a bit closer now. We've considered these two terms by looking at the difference this minus that. Let's also subtract this g2p of z. So we have the square of p prime of z minus 4p of z cubed minus g2p of z. So the key point is that this g2p of z looks very much like this. I've just shifted this across from the point of view that if I multiply this by g2, I get the same term here. And the only difference is that I've got these higher order terms here. So essentially, you have something in that analytic. This difference is analytic. We want to show it's a constant, g3, but we at least know that it's analytic. OK. So what else can we say about this? Well, of course, you're just building this function from the doubly periodic function p and doubly periodic function p prime of z. So it's also doubly periodic. OK. Now remember, when we think about doubly periodic functions, all its values are determined by its values on this parallelogram called the fundamental parallelogram. OK, so the values here are just a repetition of the ones here. And this is compact. So the values that it can take are the same as the values on this compact set, which must be bounded. So you have a bounded analytic function. And by Leovold's theorem, that tells you that this has to be actually constant. So this is a wonderful application of Leovold's theorem, which establishes this polynomial relationship between this rather interesting Weierstrass p function and its derivative. So let's see what we can do with this rather intriguing polynomial relationship between the Weierstrass p function p of z and its derivative. Well, one way to reformulate it and capture a little bit more information is through the following theorem here. And the theorem involves two objects. Firstly, c mod this lattice lambda, which was z plus z tau, where tau is the second period and 1 is the first period. So remember this is a two torus. And the other object is going to be a cubic curve inside the complex projective plane. And it's defined by this cubic equation y squared equals 4x cubed plus g2x plus g3. Of course you should be able to see the relationship between this and the formula here. If you substitute for the derivative of py and for p of z x, you'll just get this equation here. OK, so it says that these two objects are actually in bijective correspondence with each other and in a very natural way. How's that? Well, the bijection goes as follows. It sends the class z plus lambda to the following. So I'll just give the affine coordinates. So remember. This is an extension of the xy plane. It gets sent to p of z for the x coordinate and p prime of z for the y coordinate. Okay, so to check that uh, this makes sense, you have to check that this does land in the correct image. 
so the xy's which satisfy this equation. So why is that? Well, you have to check that if you put in p prime of z for y and p of z for x, this equation holds. And that's what this lemma does for you. It tells you that the image of this has to lie inside this cubic curve here. The other thing that you need to check is, well, you could have picked a different representative in this coset. But what would that do? If you picked a different representative of this coset, then you would have shifted it by some number of ones and taus, because lambda is generated by one and tau, and double periodicity of this p and this p prime tells you that this value is still the same. So it didn't matter which representative you picked, the answer is the same here. And if you know a little bit more about complex analysis, it's actually not difficult to see that the image is the whole of this curve. And the other thing that you need to check, which also requires a little bit of theory, but it's not difficult, is that this is injective. So you have this wonderful fact that now actually gives you a complete description of this cubic curve, which was something that was somewhat mysterious before. You can think of it as just this two torus, C mod lambda. And in particular, it tells you that this cubic curve has a rather interesting feature. Unlike other plane curves, it has a group structure. This is just a, the group C with addition as the group operation modulo this additive subgroup. So this is actually an abelian group as well, which is an extremely interesting fact, which is used quite a lot. Okay, so let's look conversely and start with a cubic curve inside the complex projective plane. In other words, we have a cubic equation, f of x, y equals zero, which is of degree three. Now we can't pick any degree three polynomial here. For example, you can't have a linear times a quadratic. But the generic one is what's called non-singular. And they're the ones which allow you to get some sort of a Riemann surface out of this curve. So in those cases, so that's most of these cubic uh, polynomials, you'll find that you can actually fit it into this setup. In other words, you can find this lambda such that this is an isomorphism. So in other words, every non-singular cubic curve has this abelian group structure and can be thought of as a two torus C mod lambda. And now we can see some of the complexities that arise when you study even just plane curves in algebraic geometry. So if you look at projective lines and conics, in the complex case, it's quite easy to see what they are. They're isomorphic to each other. And in fact, topologically, they're just the two sphere. So what happens, for example, with a projective line, you have the complex plane, but you have to add a point at infinity, so you wrap it up to get the sphere. However, the non-singular cubic is very different. And one way to see that is from the topology, in this case, when you look over the complex numbers. The non-single cubic curve is homeomorphic to the two torus, which is very different from the sphere. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.